It'll fight in France. It'll fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. The year is 1942, and the Second World War is now in its third year. During this year, many important battles would take place that would decide the outcome of the war. Some of these battles include the US victory at the Battle of Midway, and the Allied victory against Germany and Italy's North African campaign. However, despite these battles having great significance to the end of the war, they are all overshadowed by another battle. The Battle of Stalingrad. In the year leading up to Stalingrad, Germany would launch Operation Barbarossa, or better known as the Invasion of the Soviet Union. This operation not only marked Germany's betrayal towards the Soviet Union, but became the entire reason as to why they lost the war. If they had never betrayed the Soviet Union, then the world may look quite different today. June 1941 Operation Barbarossa is in full effect. It is the largest ground invasion in history with an estimate of 4 million troops. Hitler assigns his men to attack three cities. The first being the city of Leningrad, which is home to the Soviet Union's Baltic fleet and over 600 factories. This assault is given to General Wilhelm von Lieb. The second city is Moscow, the Russian capital. This assault is led by General Fedor von Bock, with an armored division under the command of General Heinz Guderian. The third city was Stalingrad. However, this was a strange order. While Stalingrad was home to many resources and a river source, it lacked any strategical purpose. The main reason Hitler wanted to take it was to give Stalin a big middle finger without actually being there. And to be fair, if a city is named after you, letting it fall into enemy hands would cause a big decrease in morale. When proclaiming the invasion of Stalingrad, Hitler said they would kill all the male residents and deport all the women. When hearing of the impending attack, Stalin himself ordered all the residents of Stalingrad who are strong enough to carry a rifle to fight. And when he said all, he meant all. Russia was one of the only powers who deliberately let women fight in the war. However, it caused many to see them as desperate and foolhardy. Yet despite these accusations, the Red Army would keep the use of female soldiers. Many of the women who became soldiers would go on to find names for themselves throughout the war, with the most well-known being Lady Dead. Ludmila Pavlechenko would fight in World War II as a sniper, racking up a total of 309 kills by the end of the war. Out of the total 2,000 female Russian snipers who served in the war, she was one of the 500 who survived. Ludmila would also become the first Soviet-born citizen to be welcomed into the White House and would travel the U.S. with First Lady Eleanor to speak on the role of women in the army. Summer 1942 To prepare for the battle, people have made trenches and foxholes to help create a line of defense. Stalingrad was one of the only, if not the only, battle to have everyone working to help the war effort. They had children help dig defensive lines and some were even taught how to shoot. Russia used everyone they had, mainly due to the fact they weren't fully modernized yet. They still heavily relied on horses and wagons and other rural inventions, so in order to make sure things were done on a timely scale, they had everyone work together. August 1942 the Battle of Stalingrad begins. In the month leading to the battle, Germany fought against the Stalingrad Front, which was a small unit of Soviet armies. They had held out against the Germans for about a month, but was ultimately forced to retreat back towards Stalingrad, where the real battle was just about to begin. The Soviets had much time to prepare for the battle. 
However, Stalin refused to evacuate the 400,000 residents of Stalingrad. He saw everybody as a possible soldier and thought if it was known that women and children were at the scene of the battle that the strength of the Soviet resistance would increase. He would also force many residents to fight against their will, and in order to get them to fight and for no surrender, Stalin gave his infamous order number 227, not one step back. This meant you either fight or we kill you. Fearing for their lives, many Soviets fought in the battle without considering surrender as a possibility. The Battle of Stalingrad started with heavy bombing that was more frantic than the bombing of London. The German Luftwaffe would bomb many factories and homes while also keeping constant watch over the Volga River, which was used to transport Soviet forces into Stalingrad. A female Soviet soldier had stated when coming into Stalingrad, I had been imagining what war was like, everything on fire, children crying, cats running about, and when we got to Stalingrad, it turned out to be really like that, only more terrible. Many soldiers entering Stalingrad would be sunk by Stukas, and those who did make it wouldn't always be given a gun due to limited resources and would be told to find one off a dead soldier. To counteract the bombings, the Soviets implemented the 1077th Anti-Aircraft Regiment, which covered Stalingrad Tractor Factory and the Volga Ferry near Latashanka. This regiment was also the first to see German tanks. As a response to the anti-aircraft regiment, the Germans used their armored panzer division to make their way into the city. By September, the Germans had fully made their way into the city, which instigated the brutal urban combat of Stalingrad. The Soviets and the Germans were fighting factory to factory, street to street, building to building. The combat was so intense and so close quarters it's truly impossible to understand the full scale of it today. A letter found on a dead German read, We must reach the Volga. We can see it, less than a kilometer away. We have constant support of our aircraft and artillery. We are fighting like madmen, but cannot reach the river. The whole war for France was shorter than one fight for one Volga factory. We must be up against suicide squads. They have simply decided to fight to the last soldier. And how many soldiers are left over there? When will this hell come to an end? By September 12th, the Soviets were pushed further back into the city. They had been reduced to 90 tanks, 700 motors, and just under 20,000 soldiers. By this time, it was said that Stalingrad was no longer a city. The streets no longer measured by meters, but by corpses. On September 27, the Germans had full control of the southern part of Stalingrad, causing the battle to shift north towards the Industrial District. The Industrial District holds home to Stalingrad's three largest factories, where it is said the battle was at its worst. Just like at the beginning of the battle, German bombers cleared a path for the infantry. The Soviet Siberian Division was hit the worst, with the German forces launching a total of 117 assaults on them. 23 of them on one day alone. To counteract these assaults, a heavy amount of traps were set, some killing 20 Germans at a time. Despite the traps, the Germans were still able to push their way through the factories. The fighting inside the factories alone lasted all the way until the end of October. By the middle of November, the Germans captured 90% of the city and have finally reached the river banks of the Volga, splitting the last Soviet forces in two. At this point, the Germans have lost about 60,000 men. 12,000 were killed, 45,000 are wounded, and 2,000 are missing. The Soviets are pinned against a wall, being pushed heavily back into the city, but they still have one advantage. Winter. Unlike winter in other countries, Russian winter was extremely cold. During this winter, it would reach minus 40 degrees Celsius, which isn't even close to their coldest winter of minus 67.7 degrees Celsius, or minus 89.9 degrees Fahrenheit, which was in 1933. 
Knowing the Germans wouldn't be prepared for the cold, the Soviets used this to their advantage. Just before the winter, Soviet General Vasilevsky and Marshal Zhukov planned Operation Uranus. Operation Uranus took advantage of the winter, which they knew would cause less movement across the German forces. And with that knowledge, they planned to surround the German forces, trapping them inside the city. The Germans' weakness was ordering its smaller divisions to take charge of strategical locations while the bigger army moved forward. The divisions left in charge were usually the non-German ones, and most of them still had grudges against Germany for conquering them. For example, the Romanian unit, which had significantly less men, were tasked to defend the north and south flank of the steeps, which led into the city of Stalingrad. November 19th, 1942. Operation Uranus is launched. Under the command of General Vatunin, the 1st Guards Army, 5th Tank Army, and 21st Army attack Romanian forces on the north flank. The Romanian forces before this fight had heard of the upcoming attack and had begged for reinforcements, but the Germans refused, and as a result, they were overrun. The same thing happened the next day with the Romanians in the south flank. Overrun by tanks and having poor equipment, they surrendered. With this, the split Soviet forces ran west to link with each other, effectively surrounding the German forces in Stalingrad by November 23rd. Despite being surrounded, the German army held strong. They kept all men at their posts, forcing all divisions to watch after themselves. However, their fate would soon be sealed. Field Marshal Erich von Manstein, when asked by Hitler if they needed to surrender, said no. He stated they had a plan to break the 6th Army out of the encirclement, called Operation Winter Storm. Winter Storm involved the use of the 4th Panzer Army to blast their way through the Soviet encirclement. However, by stating he wouldn't surrender, Hitler made a public speech saying that they will not leave the city and they would fight till the last man. So if anything did go wrong, surrender was no longer an option. To ensure the success of the operation, the Germans had aircrafts bring needed supplies into the encirclement. However, with only one airfield and a limited number of aircrafts, they could only deliver 105 tons of supplies a day, when the minimum needed is around 750 tons. Knowing they wouldn't have much time, Manstein's operation was launched. They fought their hardest through the Russian defenses, reinstating the brutal urban combat from before. November 24, 1942. General Ehad Ross is summoned to help with Operation Winterstorm, bringing some relief to the Germans fighting outside the encirclement. However, as soon as their train arrives, they are instantly under fire by Russian artillery. The fighting to reach the trapped 6th Army reaches a climax on December 18th. By now, the Germans have pushed to within 48 kilometers from the 6th Army's position. But something is wrong. The 6th Army hasn't advanced at all. The starving, low-equipped troops are still in the same position since the beginning of the month. They don't have enough supplies to reach Manstein's group. If they tried now, the tanks would only reach 30 kilometers before running out of fuel. So to not risk a failed attempt, they have stayed put. December 16, 1942. As a way to force the Germans to surrender, the Soviets launched Operation Little Saturn. It consisted of 15 divisions supported by 100 tanks. Their main goal is to crush the last lines of German defenses and force a surrender. For three days, the Soviets fought against the German mobile defense force, mainly consisting of Italians. The Italians held the line as long as they could, but by December 19th, they were defeated. By this point, the cold is having a bad effect for both sides, but the Germans are having the worst of it. If you fall asleep, you could be frozen to death. If you stood in one position too long, you could be frozen to death. Weapons were dramming as well because of the cold weather. It said that soldiers would have to resort to peeing on their weapons to warm it up and unjam it. As a result, many snipers were used compared to machine guns to reduce jamming potential. December 18, 1942. 
Things aren't going well for Manstein, and he pleads with Hitler to let them surrender. But Hitler won't allow it, because if they do, it would look bad in the public eye, symbolizing Germany is on the verge of defeat. Soviet forces now ask the Germans if they want to surrender through loudspeakers and aircrafts, stating that their sick will be treated for and ensuring their safety. But the Germans refuse for fear of treason back home. January 10th, 1943. The Soviets launched the biggest bombardment of the entire war up to this point, with 7,000 Modars, field guns, and launchers firing on German positions. The Germans were forced to fall back deeper into the city, with some even running to the Soviets individually to surrender to them. It was complete chaos for the German forces as they tried to defend with what little they had. On January 22nd, the Germans were offered another chance to surrender. But again, Hitler refused them the right to do so, saying that they must fight to the last man and that their bravery will go down in Germany's history as their greatest struggle. By January 26, the urban combat split the German forces, one to the north and the other to the south. Both forces would hold out every day, engaging in intense combat with the Soviet forces. However, by the end of January, despite whatever punishment they may face, the German forces surrendered to the Soviet Union. Around 100,000 Germans were taken prisoner, including 22 generals. Many Soviets recall the smell of German headquarters, saying it was unbelievably filthy. You couldn't get through the front or the back doors. The filth came all the way up to your chest, along with whatever human waste and who knows what else. When hearing about the surrender, Hitler was furious. The Nazi government had to keep the loss of Stalingrad away from the public. This was the first time the Nazi government actually had to acknowledge a loss during the war. However, for the Soviet Union, this battle would go down as one of their greatest victories. They had not only stopped the invasion of Russia, but they had turned the tide of the war into the Allies' favor. Both sides fought with great strength and ferocity, but ultimately, military tactics and strategy, along with morale and determination, were the deciding factors of this battle. However, while the Soviets did win, it wasn't without a cost. The Battle of Stalingrad had an estimate of 1.8 million casualties in total, marking it the deadliest battle of World War II. But it showed no matter what, so long as a group of people have some type of determination, they can accomplish whatever they dream to do.